We're police officers. We're not trained to handle this kind of violence. 2024 isn't all it's cracked up to be. If you were living back in the early 90s, did you expect the world would turn out the way it did? I mean, Back to the Future promised us flying cars, and we're still waiting for that one. No, instead of flying cars and moon hotels, we got 140 characters and repetitive 30 second dance videos. But how did we get here? After all, one movie tried to warn everyone, and no one paid attention. Exactly what was the hidden warning behind the 1993 action classic Demolition Man? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the dumpster fire that is modern Hollywood. As explosive as its title, Demolition Man marries the cinematic action of classic 1980s action movies with the seeming utopia and endless party that was the 1990s. 1993 was the second full year after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the world seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. Everyone was out partying and doing ecstasy at clubs, or molly as the kids call it these days. The future seemed sunny and bright, but not everyone saw it that way. Some people saw the hidden dangers ahead. The movie begins in the near future of 1996, where we find the controversial super cop John Spartan, also known as the Demolition Man. Spartan is hot on the trail of the evil mastermind Simon Phoenix, a powerful gang leader who has set up a large and dangerous territory for himself. Golly gee whiz, this looks eerily familiar to the RHAZ or the Red House Autonomous Zone in Portland, doesn't it? After Phoenix kidnaps a busload of hostages and takes them to his headquarters, Spartan tracks him down and completes a thermal scan, suggesting there are no hostages inside. Little does he know what Simon Phoenix is truly up to. The two face off, and although Phoenix ends up in cuffs, the police drag out the bodies of all the hostages and come to the conclusion that Spartan's actions killed them. Despite insisting that Phoenix had planned this all along, Spartan is charged with involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to 70 years in a new prison where inmates are cryogenically frozen and subjected to behavioral reconditioning. 36 years later in 2032, the prison is still in operation. Los Angeles has changed considerably, having become a community of peace. The cities of LA, Santa Barbara, and San Diego have merged into one massive urban center after a giant earthquake devastated most of Southern California in 2010. But this seeming utopian society hides a deep, dark secret that is slowly revealed throughout the course of the film. What we see of the society does indeed look peaceful and serene. The San Angeles Police Department hasn't dealt with a violent crime in over 16 years, and at the center of it all is the seemingly benevolent, influential thinker Dr. Raymond Cocteau. This grand architect bears a striking resemblance to another megalomaniac, Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum. You may have already heard of the WEF on Joe Rogan, where he frequently quotes Klaus Schwab, you will own nothing and be happy. Indeed, in the world of Demolition Man, the future doesn't have ownership or property rights in the traditional sense. Physical cash has been eradicated and replaced with social credits, but I'll get back to this a little bit later since it's a really important point. Getting back to the movie, we see that Simon Phoenix finds himself unfrozen for a parole hearing, and after somehow knowing the password to his restraints, unlocks his shackles and kills the guards before tearing out the warden's eye to bypass the prison's retinal scanners. Back at the San Angeles Police Department headquarters, the police force is alerted by their central computer, L7, of a code 187, which they don't recognize until L7 identifies it as a murder-death kill, something they hadn't seen in nearly two decades. This is yet another interesting concept that the movie threw in that everyone missed. AI has been a hot topic lately. Many people have warned about the advent of ASI, or artificial superintelligence, kind of like what we see in the Terminator and the Matrix franchises. We're not there yet, and it looks like the world of Demolition Man isn't there yet either. But the computer L7 looks to be like some sort of AGI or general AI that possesses the ability to understand, learn, and apply knowledge across a wide range of tasks, even the very frightening task of police work. 
While this hasn't been implemented by any police force yet that we know of, it is definitely a scary possibility that can lead to a dark path like the one we saw in Tom Cruise's Minority Report. L7 also looks scarily like China's surveillance apparatus for its own society. But in this future, despite having so many advantages, the weak-minded people on the police force seem incapable of handling this kind of dangerous criminal, so they decide to unleash the Demolition Man on 2032. An old-fashioned cop for an old-fashioned criminal. And so, Spartan is thawed and reinstated to the police force. He's told that his wife was killed in the big earthquake of 2010, while his daughter's whereabouts are unknown. This was quite a shock for Spartan. To make things worse, when he asks for a cigarette, he's told that unhealthy vices and foods from the past have now become illegal. Remember that this movie was made in 1993. Michael Bloomberg, during his tenure as mayor of New York City for three terms in the early 2000s, attempted to outlaw large sugary drinks in 2012. Specifically, in May 2012, the New York City Board of Health proposed a ban on the sale of sugary drinks larger than 16 ounces. That's about half a liter for your Europeans. In restaurants, movie theaters, and other food service establishments, the regulation aimed to combat obesity and promote public health. However, the ban faced significant opposition and legal challenges. In March 2013, just before it was set to take effect, a New York State Supreme Court judge invalidated the ban. Despite appeals, the New York Court of Appeals, the state's highest court, ultimately struck down the ban in June 2014, preventing it from being implemented. But the banning of foods didn't stop there. Other enterprising supervillains stepped in to pick up Mike Bloomberg's slack. Microsoft founder Bill Gates became very deeply involved with global health issues as well as global warming. Due to his asinine views on climate change, Gates placed all the blame for greenhouse gases on cows. According to him, everyone needed to halt their consumption of meat products and start eating lab-grown fake meat. When a guy like that says that, I'm like, are you making money because of this? Like, why are you saying that? And by the way, you look like shit. Like, because if you're eating those those plant-based burgers or whatever the fuck you're doing, like, you're obese. Like, a guy like that telling people about he's got these breasts Moves. and this, this gut, and I'm like, this is crazy. You're one of the richest guys on earth. You have access to the best nutrients, the best – you could have a, an amazing trainer. You, you could be in phenomenal shape, and you're giving out public health advice. You, you're giving out health advice, and you're sick. Common sense dictates that the human body isn't designed to process this shit. I'll give you my own experience with it. A few years ago, at the height of the Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger craze, I went to a friend's barbecue where he actually had these burgers. Very cautiously, I only ate a quarter of one burger. The smell triggered an innate response where my brain said, wait, stop, don't put this in your mouth. But I'm the kind of guy who has to try anything at least once. The texture of the burger made of fake meat was like that of shredded hot dogs. The artificial heme, or the fake blood, tasted repugnant, like a fake variation of real meat juice. The results the next day were nothing short of horrific. I took the blackest, most foul-smelling dump of my life. I swear to you that my poop looked like crude oil and smelled like that burger initially smelled. I knew right then that fake meat is not healthy for humans. The point is that humans have done things a certain way for thousands of years for a reason. Way back in the day, a million years ago, our ancestors figured out what we could and what we couldn't eat. You ate a poisonous mushroom and it was game over for you. Sorry Charlie, but them's the breaks. Outlawing food that's worked for humans for millions of years can only lead to disastrous consequences and Demolition Man tried to warn us about this. It even tackled the subject of fake meat when John Spartan ate the rat burger. Just don't ask where the meat comes from. <clears throat> Hopsley, what's that supposed to mean? Do you see any cows around here, Detective? Que es de esta carne? Esta carne es de rata. That's right. The world of Demolition Man outlawed meat as Bill Gates is hell-bent on doing here. And that's not the most dystopian part of all this. John Spartan is also told that he has had a microchip implanted in his hand 
so his location can be monitored at all times. Spartan objects immediately, criticizing the fascist New World Order and their inability to understand a criminal like Phoenix. The world of Demolition Man seems to have eradicated all forms of physical cash and money. Instead, they use social credits that they earn through good behavior or behavior that the central authority deems appropriate. You step out of line and suddenly you're unable to get back into your own house, you can't travel, can't get a hotel, and can't get anything to eat. This sounds a lot like modern day China. The CCP in China has enacted some of the most dystopian policies ever created by mankind. The social credit system in China is a government-led initiative that assesses and influences the behavior of individuals and organizations based on a scoring system. It collects data from various sources including government records and surveillance technology to assign scores reflecting trustworthiness and reliability. A high score can grant privileges like easier access to loans and job opportunities, while a low score can result in penalties such as travel restrictions and slower internet speeds. This isn't some far off future, this is happening right now in China, and the US government even tried to implement that here with the proposed vaccine passes during the plight that was the unspecified virus of unknown origin. If you didn't have a vaccine, you couldn't travel, severely restricting your personal freedoms. I should know, I live in the Nazi Republic of New York City, where restaurants, bars, and museums and other venues ban those without their pass. Your papers, please. The chip that John Spartan had implanted in his hand was encoded with that same social credit score. Whenever he uses curse words, he's fined a credit. Even speech was controlled in San Angeles. You couldn't even express yourself however you wanted to without the government interfering and clamping down on your basic human rights, like free speech. We saw this on full display in 2017 with Dr. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson testified in front of the Canadian Parliament on May 17, 2017 regarding Bill C-16, which proposed amendments to the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code. His concerns centered around compelled speech and the potential implications of the bill on freedom of expression. The controversy stemmed from being compelled to use a person's perceived pronouns. Peterson had no intention of having a governing body tell him how to express himself. Indeed, the secular religion of wokeism introduced this benign control over people's speech. It all starts with something small like pronouns, and before long, you're out here with Guy Montag burning books and watching out for Big Brother in 1984. Another scary prediction in the film comes when the San Angeles PD realizes that Phoenix's immediate plan is to arm himself and continue his terrorist activities, so they rush to the museum, the only place where you can get weapons. In the hellscape that is San Angeles, the right to bear arms seems to be non-existent. After all the crises that the world of Demolition Man went through like earthquakes and pandemics, they decided to get rid of all guns. The only place left to even see a gun is at a museum. The film showed us the unexpected consequences of full and complete gun control. A population unable to protect itself from a tyrannical government imposing harsh rules to control them in the name of peace and security. Just look at what happened to Australia during the pandemic. Again, we see the wisdom of our ancestors. Way back when, the Founding Fathers painstakingly thought of pretty much everything they could when they were inventing a democratic government from scratch. They had all lived under the boot of the British, and they had lived through the horrors of the American Revolution, and so they had a unique perspective on tyranny. They knew that the only reason they were able to even fathom of a revolt was that the population was well armed. They then enshrined the right to bear arms in the US Constitution so that future generations would have a fighting chance at defending democracy and the fragile concept of individual freedom. In the film, we see that Dr. Raymond Cocteau and the government of San Angeles is able to keep the population docile because they have no physical means with which to rebel and change their government. This is what those on the conservative side argue for. Now, you may be saying to yourself, okay, just try rebelling against the US government and try fighting the largest, most sophisticated army in history. 
Well, at the time, the British were the most sophisticated army in history, and we still kick their ass with our guns. So underestimating the so-called well-armed militia is a mistake for every tyrannical government. After all, guerrilla warfare has proven effective not once, but three times against the American war machine in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. America lost each and every one of those conflicts to a bunch of ragtag rebels. Look what I did to this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. But exactly how is Cocteau planning on squashing any remaining dissent? After Phoenix is able to escape through the museum's roof, we see him run into Cocteau and he tries to shoot him, although he finds that he's unable to pull the trigger due to his cryogenic re-education. Another scary concept from the CCP. Cocteau then tells Phoenix that he should actually be hunting a man named Edgar Friendly, his ideological opponent and the leader of a resistance group called the Scraps who live below ground now. When Spartan approaches, Cocteau insists that he's grateful that he saved his life and invites him and Lenina Huxley to dinner at Taco Bell. Hilariously, the only restaurant left after an event called the Franchise Wars. This is yet another commentary on the constant need for corporations to put profits over everything else and eliminate all competition to have one major monopoly. We see this all the time throughout America today. A weakened Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission have in recent years allowed a few high-profile mergers such as Microsoft's purchase of Activision Blizzard to go through thereby reducing competition and resulting in a negative experience for consumers. The film goes on to warn us about economics once again when they all go out to dinner. Spartan is clearly a fish out of water and at dinner, Cocteau and his guests grill him about his unruly methods and vulgar language. Cocteau dismisses him as Spartan spots shady looking people outside the restaurant and runs after them. He takes them down, but stops when they drop a container of food stolen from the restaurant. The overexcited Huxley praises Spartan for his hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he scolds her, saying that the people he'd roughed up were just trying to get something to eat. This is kind of where we find ourselves in 2024, with food prices surging completely out of control. Food has gotten so expensive that people steal from supermarkets because they know they can resell the items to bodegas or convenience stores for a tiny profit or eat the food themselves. Can you blame any of them when there are no jobs for the disenfranchised? Our 2024 is a new gilded age. But that's not all. The film also warns against various unspecified viruses of unknown origin. Telling him that the evening's violence has aroused her, Lenina Huxley takes Spartan back to her apartment and politely asks if John will have sex with her. She then places a VR helmet on his head, which uses a form of sensory induction to stimulate their brains directly. John is obviously appalled, preferring physical contact like a man, but Huxley explains that physical contact and fluid exchange are illegal because of STDs. As I mentioned earlier, our government imposed heavy sanctions on personal freedom during the pandemic. They didn't go as far as to outlaw sex, but they did impose lockdowns that might as well have, and that further alienated not only the disenfranchised, but innocent people as well. The lack of social interaction during the pandemic led to an epidemic of male loneliness and suicides. Those who didn't off themselves find solace in virtual sex through sites like OnlyFans. We've already got VR adult entertainment, so Demolition Man's depiction of this is not far off. It's actually scary how accurate it was for 1993. The ending of the movie seems to present a more middle-of-the-road solution. Spartan basically says that the Scraps and those living under Cocteau's rules should work together and find a balance between personal freedoms and established boundaries. That being said, the main message seems to be, take everything in moderation. There should be no extremes on either side. And this is truly a sensible lesson to take away here. Extremism on any side is obviously not the right solution for any situation. The key to solving disagreements is discussion, and it is a middle ground. What I love about this movie is that on the surface, San Angeles is actually a utopia with no crime, no clear class divides, no unnecessary deaths, and general levels of happiness and well-being going through the metaphorical roof. 
but there's good reason to be afraid of a world masterminded by a single man. Beneath the cracks is unrestrained rage towards the people the system is purported to be helping. We're then shown the other side of the coin, and in the underbelly of the utopia, Edgar Friendly peddles his libertarian ideologist to us, explaining, I'm the enemy, because I like to think. I like to read. I'm into freedom of speech and freedom of choice. And Edgar isn't kidding about no freedom of choice. Even restaurants are all the same. All food chains have become Taco Bells. This is a silly footnote to everything else in the story, but if there's one thing that's key to the utopian dystopian narratives, it's this idea of monolithic corporate control. The film pretty clearly presents that Cocteau is the bad guy and that trying to control everyone's impulses will only result in more trouble. Even Phoenix, pure evil villain that he is, declares, Look, you can't take away people's right to be assholes. And he's right. As the movie shows, taking away freedom of choice just leads to a life full of repression. You can see this in how Huxley longs for excitement, chaos, and even sex. I mean, in this world, you can't even have salt or meat because it's perceived to be bad for your health. But we all know that everything should be consumed in moderation. The body can't actually live without salt. I should know, I experienced sodium deficiency after I ran the Tokyo Marathon and completely sweated out a ton of sodium and was about to pass out. So of course, you're gonna wind up with defectors like Edgar and a large majority that secretly yearn for the old ways. That's how you get MAGA. Demolition Man shares a lot of its DNA with the 1932 book A Brave New World, written by Aldous Huxley. Be it the use of subliminal messaging, referred to as hypnopedia in the book, the societal brainwashing resulting in a warped moral code, the omniscient leader, a changed perception of sex, to the frequent use of the word savage. Perhaps the most interesting element in the, both the book and the movie is the discussion of subliminal psychological manipulation to shape individuals. In Demolition Man, this takes the form of rehabilitation of those in the cryogenic prison, while in the book, it takes a far more sinister turn, using this type of manipulation as the very foundation of society. In Huxley's version of dystopian London, children are exposed to overt psychological manipulation to make them more useful members of society, and we're seeing that in today's world with the indoctrination of children into the cult of woke by the public school system. It becomes even more diabolical when the pharmaceutical industrial complex confuses kids into not knowing what their gender is or even how many genders there are, all in the name of financial gain. These forms of manipulation make society homogenous and unable to dissent, particularly in the case of workers who are shown stimuli to essentially love industry and city, despise literature, art, and the natural world. The scariest thing about these foundations for dystopia is that they align perfectly with tried and tested psychological techniques. While A Brave New World relies on classical conditioning for this, having people shocked when looking at certain stimuli, Demolition Man takes on the more complex form of subliminal suggestion where thoughts and beliefs are changed outside of our conscious awareness. This is seen in Phoenix throughout his incomprehensible ability to interface with future technology and Spartan's ability to knit a sweater for Lenina. Together, these point towards methods in which people could be, and in some cases already are, manipulated into certain schools of thought at odds with our individuality and personal freedoms. Schools of thought like wokeism. I've mentioned this in many of my videos, but let me more clearly define what I mean here. After the Enlightenment, we began down a path that brought us to just after the end of the Second World War. In order to save money on wages, corporations expanded the labor supply by allowing women into the workforce. This clamped down on wages, forcing both parents to work in order to make ends meet. This was just one part of the puzzle, though. The breakdown in the fabric of society all stems from the massive attack on the nuclear family. By embracing secularism and eliminating traditional religions, the masses can be controlled much more easily. Because human beings are built to believe in something, we're wired for it. 
In the late 20th century, they largely turned away from God and religious teachings, but they began believing in something else, a secular religion, if you will. This secular religion morphed into a conglomeration of several different progressive ideologies, such as fourth wave feminism, diversity and inclusion, and social justice. All this secular religion of wokeism is doing is driving a wedge between people so that they are more malleable and easily controlled. The utopia of Demolition Man is a response to increased political correctness and the ways that government can intervene upon your personal freedoms by deciding what is right and healthy for you. In San Angeles, you get fined for cursing, you can't touch anyone, and no one can even have sex for what is assuredly population control. Every facet of what it means to be human has been stripped away in favor of collective obedience in the name of peace and security. Kind of like what happened after 9-11 with the Patriot Act. Though the initial critical response to Demolition Man was lukewarm, people now praise it for how well it predicted things like restrictions on how much soda you can purchase, increased surveillance like in China, or getting slaps on the wrist if your language is too obscene whenever you misgender someone by using the wrong pronoun. Beyond its complex themes, terrific set pieces, and commitment to bringing us a terrifying dystopia, it's the performances that help sell it and can't be ignored. Wesley Snipes is anarchy personified with his Joker-like depiction of Simon Phoenix. Stallone is amazing as the gung-ho unstoppable force, and Sandra Bullock is solid as Lenina Huxley, who is used as a plot device responsible for easing us into this world inspired by her namesake and writer of A Brave New World. The true dystopia of Demolition Man goes far deeper than the fact that all restaurants turn into Taco Bell. By harking back to A Brave New World and linking itself to disturbingly real psychological techniques while employing of fireworks of show of action, Demolition Man manages to break the mold of intellectualized dystopias by creating something that is far too close to home. But what do you guys think about all this? Have you seen Demolition Man? And if so, what do you think about its deep and nuanced social commentary and predictions of the future? Please do let me know down below in the comments, and as always, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs> he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs>